Okay, so now I uh, have a pleasure of, of, uh, of, of talking to Steve Tadellis, uh, a, a person that I've just recently become friends with at the University of California, Berkeley Business School, Haas. Uh, Steve has uh, graciously agreed to let me sort of have a, a brief interview with him about um, causal inference in tech and some work that he's done on it. And um, we're just going to talk about one of his studies that I'm discussing today in the, in the Substack. Uh, on uh, paid search effectiveness uh, at eBay. So Steve, uh, thanks so much for uh, agreeing to let me talk to you about that paper. Thank you, Scott. It's a pleasure. Yeah. Well, so could you, before we start, can you just tell me a little bit about uh, how you sort of got into economics and how you got into your professional career and then what your life has been like overlapping this academic tech? Because you sort of seem to be sort of like, you know, how Varian and and Susan Athey is kind of like straddling these, two, an early person straddling these two spaces. Oh, you're putting me in very good company. I, I uh, think I've just lowered the average there a bit, but uh, um, well, I got into economics by coincidence uh, in my uh, late twenties, mid to late twenties, when I realized I should probably get a bachelor's degree because I only had an associate degree in electrical engineering. I picked economics because my grades weren't good enough to get into an engineering school. And, uh, and then I fell in love with it and had a professor uh, by the name of Yossi Greenberg, who was very influential and uh, got me interested in an academic career. And the rest was history. So that's how I got into academia. Um, it's interesting because when I started my PhD, I, I left uh, six years of working as a, initially a systems engineer and then as a sales and contracts manager in a tech firm in Israel. And I was really enamored by game theory. So I, I did like 180 degree, tell me how close you are to realism so I know how far away to be from you. Mm -hmm. so pure theory. Um, and, uh, and that's what I focused on in grad school. Um, but my tastes became a little more applied throughout grad school. So I was what at the time was called an applied theorist, uh, mm. a species that not, uh, is, is not in much existence these days. Uh, mm. and, um, and then when I got my first job at Stanford and a year later, uh, Pat Byery joined, uh, became a close friend and dear colleague, and we started working together because I was inspired by some of his uh, observations on contracts in, in uh, reality compared to contracts in theory. Mm. And then through Pat, I got interested in empirical work. And shamefully, I will admit that I still have other people doing all the coding because um, I don't know if uh, my, my friend Hido Imben, so I'll, I'll brag a little there, uh, will remember when he was a professor at Harvard and we met uh, and I was a first or second year student. I think I told him once, tell me how close you are to econometrics so I know how far away to be from you. Uh, again, I, I really wanted nothing to do with data. But uh, my, my interests apparently were always more applied than I was willing to admit. So mm -hmm. I got into teaching myself the, uh, um, you know, the ideas behind correct applied microeconomics but never enough to, you know, sit down and clean data and pull data and mm. run questions. And thankfully, I've been blessed with many, many co-authors uh, that uh, have have been patient with me not doing that part of the job, but yeah. participating and contributing in other ways. Yeah. And uh, eventually, I found my way to eBay. They they tapped me um, a little over a decade ago, asking if I want to come and spend some time there. And it sounded like Disneyland to me. Yeah. Uh, so that's how I started uh, my foray back into industry, kind of full circle right. from what I ran away from when I started my PhD. Yeah, yeah. How have you liked it? What, what sort of the things... How would you compare to someone that doesn't know, you know, how the other half lives? What would you say is uh, similar and what's different? What do you what what do you think people should know more about it? OK, so I, I'd say um, the two most striking differences uh, for academics who don't know what's happening in industry is, you know, the con, let's say, is what you work on is constrained by what the business is interested in. You know, like 
put Microsoft Research aside because that's an entity that's you know a, a whole different animal. Uh, you used to have Bell Labs and and uh, and other such uh, entities that mostly have disappeared. Um, but the pro is that one, you're working on things that have a real impact on the company's you know success, bottom line, product, etc. Yeah. And second, I have to say the 90-10 rule or 80-20 rule is practice in industry and it is refreshing mm. uh, when you get 80 to 90% of the work done mm. um, and this is good enough. Ship, mm. launch, move on. Oh, that's great. As opposed to the, uh, you know, six to 12 months of working on a paper, reaching the 80, 90, yeah. and then spending the next three to 10 years yeah. dealing with referees who don't always bring it to a hundred. Yeah, uh, exactly. Right? Oh, that, that's a, that's a big sell. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sold and more money. That sounds great. <laughs> yeah. uh, wow. That's awesome. Well, uh, so I want to talk about this paper um, that you published in uh, Econometrica with, um, let me just remind myself of the authors, Blake and Nosco. Right, Tom um, Blake, Chris Nosco. Yeah. Can, can you tell me a little bit about the idea for this paper, where it generated? You know, it. it um, I, I teach microeconomics to MBAs. Mm. Uh, which is a course about how to think about stuff, right? right. And uh, my first slide has uh, the following question. What are the two things that, uh, you know, create success? And number one is dumb luck, mm. right? And number two is good decision-making, mm. uh, often mixed with dumb luck. And, and I have to admit that this paper was written because of some dumb luck and then some good uh, decision-making. But mm. uh, uh, there were at least, I would say, uh, three points in this process that were purely dumb luck. And let me describe them. So first of all, um, Chris and I were both at eBay. We started together. Uh, he graduated from Harvard, was uh, on, took a year postdoc deferring an offer from the University of Chicago Booth School, uh, the marketing department. And um, we were given free range to work on whatever we wanted, uh, as long as it had some business relevance. Right. And um, we were advertised in the company as, you know, hey, we now have economists. Uh, anybody want to speak with them? And one of the groups that reached out was um, some folks in marketing. And in particular, they were interested in measuring what they call customer lifetime value. Mm. Um, think of this basically as the expected net present value of a random average customer. Oh, I see. Um, so, you know, some prediction of how many purchases they'll make, what's the average price, you know, when will they churn and, and so on. Mm. Uh, and they had some models that were really not very, uh, uh, not very smart to, to to say the least. And uh, we try to help build other models, but that got us exposed to some other folks in, in the marketing group. And one of them reached out to me and asked me, oh, so you're an economist, you know, econometrics. Now, when an economist asks me that, I usually say, oh, well, yeah, but not really. I mean, Heckman knows econometrics and Cato Imbens knows econometrics. And um, you know, and Scott Cunningham knows econometrics. I don't really know econometrics, uh, um, but I realized that in that setting, saying yes was probably a safe choice. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, they said, oh, that's great because we have this new econometrics initiative. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it turns out they basically hired a consulting firm uh, to try to measure the causal impact of dollars spent on different advertising channels. And um, I was intrigued because I know that there's endogeneity problems up the wazoo. Yeah. And uh, how are they going to solve that? Because I knew that they weren't doing any amount of experimentation. Right. Um, but mm. to my surprise, what they said, oh, do you mind speaking with these consultants and tell us what you think about their approach? Right. So, uh, you know, in, in other media outlets, I, I went into the color for details and the long and short of it is... Um, they were just running mindless regressions. Basically think regress sales on marketing spend 
right. which had so many problems. Uh, right. Right. And, and they thought that by controlling for seasonality and stock market and unemployment, they're, they're basically measuring the causal impact, which right. of course uh, we know is not true. Um, so then I started evangelizing the need for experimentation, especially because it was so easy to do within these frameworks, or at least some of these frameworks. Yeah. Um, uh, that fell on deaf ears because the folks who ran the marketing side um, just didn't want to experiment, didn't want to shut things down, right? They had this very deep belief that everything is working great. Yeah. And, um, and things basically stalled because they were not willing to do this. Then comes luck number two. Um, and this brings us to the natural experiment that's in the front end of that paper. Mm. Um, they did paid search advertising specifically for keyword eBay, uh, both on Google and on the Microsoft network, which was Yahoo MSN. And they wanted to renegotiate their advertising deal with uh, the MSN network. So they turned off um, uh, the paid search for keyword eBay. Wow. And we learned about this a few weeks later, Chris and I from a, an ally, uh, I'll use that word from within the marketing organization who did believe that we really need to do experimentation. And then we got our hands on the data and Chris did his magic and lo and behold, what we thought would be true was true mm. in that keyword eBay itself has zero causal impact uh, or in the jargon of the industry has zero lift. That's mm -hmm. a trick that they use. Mm -hmm. uh, because when someone types the word eBay into their browser, they're basically saying, I want to go to eBay. Exactly. Putting that ad in front of them is really just uh, doing nothing. Um, then we took those results and showed them to the CFO uh, of North America, who said, OK, you were right all along. Mm -hmm. What do we do next? And that's when we said, let's do a real controlled experiment. And they pretty much gave us uh, the keys to, to do that. Yeah, and That's what we did over a period of several months, designing it, um, reaching certain compromises. So we, we really wanted to do a very clean, you know, treatment control, completely random. Um, they really insisted on, on um, having some... Uh, subsets of geographic areas that match on historical trends, which has some value, but um, at the end of the day, it didn't uh, happen to be that important. Um, and then we ran the experiments and uh, again showed that the causal impact of advertising was literally an order of magnitude smaller than what they thought it is. Mm. And rather than giving them a positive 50% ROI on about a quarter of a billion dollars, they had a negative 60 to 80% ROI, uh, oh which God. obviously is a lot of losses. Um, and, uh, and then indeed they uh, really cut back the budget, started doing things differently. And uh, just uh, uh, to add the, the last and third part of the luck was uh, we were obviously interested in publishing this right. and a lot of people at eBay didn't want us to publish it oh, because really? it sure. didn't make the company look very smart, right? right. right. Uh, but they were doing what everybody else was doing. It's not that they were outliers. Um, and that's where you know luck number three happened. Um, you know, we got refusal after refusal up the chain and then Google redesigned their algorithm of, of organic search, which caused aggregators like eBay to plummet in the organic search. Mm. Uh, this is the whole area that people refer to as SEO or search engine optimization. This is not about the ads, but about having your website uh, have the characteristics that it's more likely to show up in a Google search. Right. Um, the leadership was, you know, livid over this Google change and very upset. And since our paper basically said, hey, Google advertising doesn't work as good as people thought it does, then the um, president of eBay at the time, we went to him for approval. He said, absolutely, let's get this paper out there so people see that Google ain't that great. Ah, wow. So uh, that's wow. how the paper actually got uh you know, into the public domain. Wow. So, wow. Like I said, luck trumps careful designs any time of Yeah, the yeah, right, right. Uh, that That's really fascinating. I, I want to follow up on a couple of things and I don't want to keep a lot of your time, but there's a lot of things you said. 
I want to talk a little bit about causal inference with respect to natural versus controlled experimentation. Mm -hmm. And I I was curious, these are kind of connected. And so maybe you can answer these kind of connected way. One is, um, I just was kind of wondering, you know, given the pervasiveness of the A-B testing, Mm -hmm. what, what exactly do you think are the barriers to doing uh, randomized control trials, given A-B testing is so common? Right. Um, that's a great question. And, you know, th- there's a combination of disciplinary frictions and uh, that lead to kind of politics. Unfortunately, politics is part of everything. So the introduction of economics into the broad umbrella of data science, so let's, mm. let me just use that as our broad umbrella and data analytics, is relatively recent. Mm. So until about a decade ago, economists in industry, and, and especially you know, those who you would refer to as chief economists, you would find them in banks, you would find them in investment uh, companies, you would find them in some large companies like Intel and Ford and, and, and so on. By and large, they were all into forecasting. Okay, wow. what are things gonna look like over the next three years? So we have some input into our planning. Okay, right. that was it. Yep. And uh, so really think very simple time series relying mostly on government uh, data and maybe some other survey data and and, and stuff like that. Um, And then about 10 years ago, 11 years ago, things started to shift um, initially with actually not Google and and, uh, Microsoft where Hal and Susan, as you mentioned, were very early participants and, and had some very important impacts there. It actually happened more with Yahoo and Amazon. Mm. Uh, and in very different ways. Amazon hired Pat Byery to become their chief economist. Yeah. And Yao hired Michael Schwartz, who's now the chief economist of Amazon. He was then an assistant professor at Harvard. And then after that, Preston McAfee, uh, who was at Caltech, um, to build a research-oriented team. Um, and uh, so, so it's very interesting. These were two different trajectories. Whereas the Yahoo experiment you know, with Preston and Michael and then other folks who joined, uh, Randall Lewis, Justin Rao, and, and, and several others, um, they were primarily doing publicly facing research mm. with an eye towards helping improve Yahoo's performance. Mm. So one of their big projects that um, is a paper, a working paper uh, uh, by uh, Michael Schwartz and Michael Ostrovsky was introducing Meyerson optimal uh, auction design, namely optimal reserve prices into the auctions for paid search advertising uh, and display advertising. And and that had a huge bottom line impact uh, in in the magnitude of hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, At Amazon, the path that Pat took was more like, no, this is not about research. This is about leveraging hardcore applied to kinemetrics, applied micro, uh, and later time series and, and, um, and applied macro uh, to help Amazon be better at what Amazon does. Right. Uh, and because of that, Amazon grew in a very different way. Uh, the group at Yahoo remained you know, a handful, maybe a dozen people, whereas at Amazon, it just grew exponentially. I don't know the numbers now, but we're talking many hundreds of PhD economists working mm. in Amazon, mm. uh, and scattered across many different parts of the company. So now going back to, you know, like introducing causal inference a la economics, right? Natural experiments, potentially score matching, uh, stuff like that. Um, it is not something that was common because in most companies, the data science, data analytics were computer scientists, machine learners, statisticians, biophysicists, bi- bio uh, engineers, physicists, uh, um, you know, people who dealt with big data, yeah. um, but didn't have the kind of causal obsession that applied micro folks do. Right. Uh, right. And, you know, we are very careful about thinking about the data generating process yeah. and mechanisms. And for many of these other disciplines, they're very much happy with kind of the black box 
let's try to reverse engineer what the data says, infer what's driving the outputs, and then increase what needs to be increased without really thinking about the, you know, things like incentives, like equilibrium, right. that we economists are driven to think of. And, and for that reason, these kind of tools, natural experiments, propensity score matching, et cetera, have not been heavily used in many companies. Right. And like I said, that has been changing more recently. Mm. Uh, as more economists and more trained applied micro folks get into these industries, these are used more. Yeah. Um, but again, because they're so different, um, one needs to be a very good ambassador yeah. for why these are needed and how they complement other methods for leadership to embrace that. Right. And that's not always easy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Right. Right. What do you think that, uh, what, what does it mean to be, what, what does it look like to be a good ambassador as an economist? What does it look like to be a bad one? Uh, well, the bad one is easy. Uh, the bad one is you assume that people are going to take you for, you know, someone who knows what they're talking about right. and believe you and, you know, embrace everything you're saying. Yeah. So the kind of attitude that uh, is not uncommon in academia, uh, which is, you know, how could you not get this, right? right. If you don't right. get it. It's your problem, not mine. Right. Um, that doesn't work in industry. Uh one of the most powerful ways of getting people to listen is to find some area where the conventional wisdom is so strong and then with some relatively simple applied microeconometrics, you show that it's actually wrong mm -hmm. in a way that you could explain it to an intelligent but not technically savvy person right those are where the big wins happen right right, right. that's right. where you could basically take someone and say hey i know we all believe this and i thought that's true too and here's what i did and here's what the data showed me and here is why i believe it's different and then you have a coherent story you have a narrative of customers behave this way or that way so so let me use the paper we started talking about as an example. Um, when we showed that, you know, they're losing about 80 cents on the dollar, obviously that was a shocking number. Yeah. And then we said, okay, how about, you know, taking the theory of advertising seriously? What does it tell us? When I say the theory of advertising, I mean the informational theory of advertising, which is more in the lines of what an economist would think, as opposed to the persuasive advertising, which is more, say, psychology, right? right? You don't like my product. I'm going to show you a picture of an island and two very attractive people, and suddenly you're going to like my product, right? right. That, right. That's not economics. Yeah. But here is what economics is. You don't know anything about my product. Mm -hmm. I will give you information about my product. If you're the kind of person with preferences for which this information means, oh, yeah, I want to buy this, you'll buy it. And if you're not, you won't. Right. So what would that imply? It implies that if I could look at different groups of people with different levels of how informative they are about eBay's offerings, then those who are least informed, for them, the advertising should work the most. And those who are most informed, for them, it should work the least. Mm -hmm. And what we did is we used a, a uh, heterogeneous classification, which is common in marketing, um, called recency frequency, uh, mm -hmm. which is the more frequent you visit eBay, the more you know about eBay, the less ads should be effective on you. And the, at the other extreme, if you've never bought anything on eBay, clearly this is where advertising could have the most bang for its buck. Right. The recency is how recently were we on eBay again, like how top of mind is it? And there we showed very clearly and very strongly that the least informed people are heavily influenced by advertising. Yeah. The returns on investment, if you target them, are humongous. Right, right. The problem is that most people who see the ads already know about eBay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So for every person that you have a great conversion, you have a hundred people from whom you just wasted a click right. and you paid for it. Right. 
And showing that to leadership, you know, it's a story that makes sense. Yeah. They didn't think about it this way. Right. And then they show how our techniques, which are not too difficult, right, to explain, yeah. uncover that regularity. Yeah. So yeah. That's what it would mean to be a great ambassador is finding something where people have very strong beliefs and showing them that those beliefs are actually either wrong or not always correct. And then having a completely uh, reasonable narrative that matches the data yeah. to change people's minds. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, sure. You know, when you say it that way, though, Steve, it, it reminds me, you know, uh, of um, just how valuable it is to be an insider, though, you know, because knowing what is uh, the, the dominant belief within the firm? It seems like such firm specific human capital. Do you think that that's, am I overstating it? I mean, no, I, how- I, don't, I don't think you're overstating it. And um, different companies have very different ways of doing things. There's also h- huge heterogeneity in the sophistication of companies, right? Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, every time I walk into a structural IO seminar and someone is estimating something off of the first order condition of optimization, yeah. I just, you know, resist that part of me that worked in industry and says, nobody fucking does this, excuse right. me. Right. Right. And remind myself of, you know, George Box, every model is wrong. Some models are useful, right? Absolutely. Um, It is a useful model. It takes a model to beat a model, depending on, you know, how forceful whoever's presenting their work is. You know, if if they really believe that this is exactly what's happening, like, well, yeah, you're you're a little bit naive, right? Right. Um, So different companies have different inside stories, different biases, different uh, procedures, and no two companies are alike. Um, you know, I'll, I'll advertise a paper of, of um, my good friend and, and colleague, Matt Backus, and co-author, his job market paper when he was uh, on the market the first time. Uh, it's coming out in, uh, maybe it already came out in the Kinemetrica, uh, that shows that when you have increased competition, um, then companies seem to become more efficient. Mm. And, um, and, and of course, you know, for a lot of economists, like, no, 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 everybody's supposed to be as efficient as they can be, but no, it just doesn't work that way. Mm. Right? When, when the heat, when you turn the heat up, then people start, you know, running around trying to see how they could do things better. A lot of companies are satisficing each in their own different way. Um, We don't have great applicable models of bounded rationality, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So we, we resort to the models we know and love. Um, And again, they have merit, they have value directionally. Uh, But every company has its own way of doing things and there is no substitute Mm -hmm. uh, for seeing how the sausage is made and recognizing that it's made in very different ways in very different companies. Yeah, yeah. Any yeah. academic who has the opportunity to engage with a company, mm-hmm. in my opinion, should. Yeah. yeah. Because it really will give whoever does that an insight into how things are done. Right. And again, it doesn't mean that we need to throw away the baby with the bathwater. No, yeah. we don't. Right. We have extremely valuable tools and techniques. Yeah. But realizing where the limits are, where those boundaries of applicability are, yeah. is important. Well, you know, Ronald Coase's theory of the firm, I believe, had a lot to do with just speaking with managers. Absolutely. You know, very li- there, there's a lot that I think we forget. That just, and there was the macroeconomist at Yale that did uh, just interviews with people to better understand hiring during uh, recessions. Yeah. You know, there's just yeah, a lot really? we just yeah. do not do and we just leave all this uh free knowledge on the table right no that's i i i will never forget i was a grad student uh in 92 or 3 uh when buley from yale came to the theory seminar to present this 
people didn't even know what to do. Like, yeah, to play, because right. you know they know him as a hardcore theorist, right? You know, writing sophisticated uh, models, and here yeah. he is interviewing people. And and I remember since it was my first year in grad school, and this was after I left the company for six years. Things like, you know, when employees are happier and then they're more productive, I'm fine. I'm, I hope this is not news to anybody in this room. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yes. Right, right. Well, so this this project started with a natural experiment. But let me ask you, in counterfactual. But, but, but importantly, right, it, it was a natural experiment that happened without any of our intervention. Right? Exactly. Yeah. Right, mm-hmm. right, right, right. Uh, so, you know, the, the thing is in, in industry, the, the AB testing concept, you know, it, it's kind of funny, like the, 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 the broader sciences have known about the value of physical randomized experimentation for most of the 20th century. But, you know, in the social sciences, it, we didn't for a long time have those physical experiments. And, you know, there was uh, a focus on other ways of getting at those same questions. And so I was kind of curious, like, it, do you think that industry uh, in tech or, or whoever really, do, do they see the value? What, what's keeping them from seeing the potential of the natural experiment? And what do you think we, uh, what do you think is the, the, the main value to you of those natural experiments? Mm. Oh, that's a great question and not an easy one for me to answer. I guess my knee-jerk reaction is, well, let's remind ourselves that natural experiments are serendipitous. Yeah. Which then means that they're very much a lucky retrospective. Right. Okay. Um, when you think of, of the, the great uh, research, you know, that started, I guess, in the 80s, 90s with natural experiments, right? If I kind of Think of uh, Josh Angris, right? Famous um, uh, lottery paper, right? Um, which you know you could argue it's a random experiment, but it's a natural experiment. Nobody designed it, right? Um, it took the brilliance and some luck of Josh to kind of think it when he thought about like, oh wait, I think I could use this. Yeah, right? yeah. Uh, or if we think of, you know, the card Kruger work on uh, minimum wage, again, it's like, it's like, oh, wait a minute, we just heard that this thing happened in Pennsylvania, and, you know, New Jersey is here, and here's the border, and okay, let's take advantage of this. Right. Um, and in many ways, I was equally lucky when I was at eBay, and it's true, I was already engaging with the marketing people, so I, I when they did that thing, when they turned off keyword eBay on the MSN network and on a Google, I'm like, okay, here's something I could sink my teeth into. Right. Um, it's, it's not the way industry typically runs because people are so focused on the inside, on the now, on where we're going, that just taking a step back and just asking, okay, to answer this, where might we find some natural experiment yeah. that we or someone else may have engaged in to get some data on this? It's just not how industry works. And to be honest, because of its serendipitous nature, I don't think one could devise a playbook of here's how to take advantage of natural experiments. Because mm. you know, if, if you're in some company, tech or not, Um, there may not be any natural experience and and you might be wasting three months looking for stuff that don't exist. Right. right? So, you know, I think that educating people on the value of natural experiments and adding it as a tool in the toolbox is an important exercise, but there's no reason to believe that this would become an overwhelming, right? As opposed, say, to propensity score matching, yeah. right? Which is something that any company with enough data on their clients could use. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah, 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 yeah. That has been my hunch also, you know, is the propensity score matching is such a nice thing to teach because it, at worst, it's a self-conscious 
effort to uh, address a lot of known selection biases, mm -hmm. you know, like to think more carefully about that. And, and it's something that is easy to implement. Uh, it's something that really rewards a lot of domain specific knowledge, you mm -hmm. know, um, uh, because you really can't uh, defend any propensity score matching unless you're really an expert on, you know, that you know the treatment assignment fairly well. Exactly. And, um, and who's going to know that if not the, the experts of the firm and who are the experts of the firm, the people that are in the firm, you right. know, and so, and that are in those pro those departments that are working on just search or whatever. Exactly. Yeah, that's a really good point. I've thought that too. It's neat that you say that. Um, uh, well, so I have one more question. Um, and, uh, uh, that's this issue of heterogeneous treatment effects. You know, I think like one of the things that I noticed in your paper was, um, you know, this finding of effects for uh, one group because it supports your information interpretation of your of the advertising. You know, um, and uh, uh, I, I guess actually two things I want to say. One, one is it's, it it, it really your paper really shows the value of this social scientific background, this theory of advertising, and mm -hmm. you see the practical relevance of it. Uh, but then related to that too, is it, it is there are these heterogeneous treatment effects. One group benefits, one group, it's a waste of money. I was curious about, you know, th the response that you got from that. Th th was that something, you know, that, that was at all surprising to people or? Um, it, it was it was the kind of thing that yes people were well the big surprise was just how ineffective paid search on average was right right and then once we kind of say well you know on average is one thing and then figuring out what are the margins over which it works is is a different exercise um, you know when when people saw that there was definitely this oh yes of course moment right oh I see said the blind man um, and um, you know, I, I think that there definitely is an appetite in industry to think about heterogene heterogeneity uh, among their customers because something that is, uh, you know, not lost on business people and industry people is this whole topic that in industry is referred to as market segmentation, right? right. Uh, marketing, right? What are my different market segments? Um, so, you know, a company like Spotify understands that students are different from adults, quote unquote, who are singles are different from couples or families. Let's do what in economics we call price discrimination and in, you know, marketing and industry we call market segmentation. Right. Uh, so the awareness of heterogeneity is there, um, but the use of heterogeneous treatment effects in experiments and in other ways of getting down to causal inference is not as widespread. Mm -hmm. um, now, one area that I think is uh, very promising uh, is the whole arena that folks like uh, Hito and Susan Athey and Victor Chernozukov and Chris Hansen's at uh, Chicago and I'm blanking on the guy's name at Duke. Uh, I think Italian name, but he'll forgive me. Peter uh, Artesiano? No, no, I can never say his last name. No. Yeah, some, someone who's been working a lot with Victor Chernozukov. But oh, anyway, okay. Um, th this whole idea of taking machine learning and causal inference yeah. and mixing them together. Right. That is in a way that is very much tailored towards heterogeneous treatment effects. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I see a lot of promise in that because this is something that the A-B testing folks who are coming from machine learning, computer science and other things, but, but no, yeah, we're gonna do this A-B test. They totally see the value in using these combinations. I mean, after all, what are all these machine learning advanced stuff and the random forests and, and all that? It's a bunch of sophisticated, non-parametric, uh, right. multi-layered regressions. Yeah. That, that's what it is, right? Um, and then understanding that you could take that together with experimentation 
I think is, is a really important contribution. I know that it is being uh, implemented in different companies, uh, some more than others. Um, you know, you have the related stuff that I'm really not at all qualified to speak about. Um, uh, the whole, um, uh, you know, bandit models and, right. and uh, um, uh, you know, where you're, you're running a bunch of experiments and then shifting the uh, um, amount of exposure depending on the early success, um, mm -hmm. you know, also I think has a lot of practical promise. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, um, yeah th those are areas that I think are going to grow and, and also areas where there is going to be, and there already is, more collaboration, more understanding across disciplines. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, this has been great, Steve. Um, I, I really, you know, talking to you uh, as like an anthropologist talking to someone from another country, uh, you know, it's really, really neat to hear the, the perspective of what goes on uh, within tech uh, from an expert and an experienced person. I appreciate you giving me your time. Uh, Thank you, Scott. Um, well, we'll talk again uh, soon. Thanks sure a lot. Take care. Okay.